What's up, guys? I'm Nick Wisdom with Heli Direct, and we're here today. And when I say we, I have a guest with me. I'll introduce in just a second. But we're here today to help some beginners through uh, how to decide on their first helicopter, right? So there's a lot of choices on the market. Uh, some look cooler than others, but what, what really are the best paths for getting into the radio control helicopter hobby? Um, so I want to introduce a man who really needs no introduction, but uh, uh, Jeff uh, West, who is another HeliDirect team pilot, is uh, a, a large content creator. He's got his own YouTube channel over at West Hobbies RC constantly doing build videos and reviews, man after my own heart, as far as that kind of content goes. Uh, so with that, Jeff West, welcome. Thank you very much, Nick, for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, man, I think, uh, you know, together, we probably both have some different ideas. That's the thing in this hobby, right? You get anybody, any group of people together, and there's a lot of differing opinions. And on most of the time, they're both valid, right? Um, there are some people who will steer you incorrectly. But I think uh, I think I'm pretty confident in saying whatever Jeff and I suggest are both great ways um, to continue into the hobby. But Everybody has their own their own opinion. We're going to give you some best practices to get into the hobby as inexpensively, meaning reducing your crash costs um, as humanly possible. Um, so speaking yeah. of that, uh, Jeff, really, what is the what should your first helicopter be? Your first model should definitely be a simulator, not even just an actual model, but a simulator. Yeah, and, and for those that don't know, uh, a simulator in, in a way is kind of like a video game, but really most transmitters on the market can link directly to a computer and via a USB cable. Some of them have wireless interfaces, but a USB cable is kind of the more common way. And it will actually let you fly a helicopter, a virtual helicopter on the screen, uh, much like you would with a controller playing a video game. Uh, and it can teach you your basic orientations. Uh, Jeff, can you tell us just a little bit about what those basic orientations are? So I'm going to grab a little model to demonstrate your basic orientation of tail and hover, which is tail to yourself, and your basic four-point hovering. And once you get good at that, then you can just bait your basic, you know, left and right, figure eight, circle. And I like to call them the orientations because, you, as you probably know, it's very boring to sit there and hover a helicopter, nose in, tail in, all the way around. It's not fun, but that'll teach you a way better pilot. You'll become a better pilot that way when you are learning that those basic back to the basics. And I even personally, to this day, I still will go all the way back to just basic hovering just to help practice that orientation, to memorize something. Yeah. And I don't know if you feel this way, Nick, but I personally like to, even to this day, I like to memorize one part of the helicopter and when i practice my orientations i always go off of that one part of the helicopter so for me it's the tail boom. i always base off the tail boom. interesting yeah it's funny we all sort of do things differently in that regard um i tend to look at the disc i think a little bit more than the boom although the boom's definitely you know front of mind for me but yeah mastering those basic orientations of what do you do when you're hovering the helicopter and it starts to drift this way away from you you have to learn how to bring it back, right? How to hold it over a single position. Because helicopters, when you fly them, even if they have a self-level mode, the wind, other factors will push them around, and they're always moving. Unless you have a, a GPS hold helicopter, which we probably won't talk about much uh, for, for this episode, but uh, it's going to drift. They're always moving. You're constantly correcting radio control helicopters, right? You, you can't really sit still and ignore them. You can't put the transmitter down and walk away. Um, so mastering those orientations is is what will save you money, honestly, because in the simulator, you practice how to do all these corrections to the point where you do them without thinking, right? When we pull a helicopter up into a hover, we don't really think about what our fingers are doing. We've practiced it so much, both in the simulator and in real life, that um, they become instinctive. And that's really the point where you're, you're trying to get to in the simulator. And if you do that in the simulator before you fly the real thing, you're going to save a ton of money. Because let's face it, how many of us know that guy at the field that didn't wait, that got too excited? that bought the ready-to-fly helicopter, and what happens on that first hover when you take off, when you haven't practiced your orientations? Crash it instantly. Yeah. And it, it's also a big, you know, it's a big thing that I've seen it countless times is that people want to get into the hobby. They go out and buy a ready-to-fly or a bind and fly to have somebody help them. You know, they have $500, $600 tied up into this helicopter with their radio and everything. They go out, crash it one time, they get discouraged, they give up. 
And I personally don't like pe seeing people give up. I want to see people succeed in this hobby. And that orientations, that basic simulator is very important. Yeah, 100%, 100%. All right, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, sim first, sim first, sim first. All right. Yeah. But so assuming that you've got a basic level of competency in the simulator, I think there's kind of three paths then we're going to talk about each one in detail, kind of one at a time, of how you can get into the hobby successfully based on what most people uh, have done. Uh, there's the micro helicopter path, meaning using very small helicopters and then progressing your way into larger models down the path. There's the experienced helper path, meaning you join a local radio control, uh, you know, helicopter and airplane club and you find someone to help you learn. And then there's you're going in alone. You're flying in a local park. It's just you. You got to figure it out. It's you and the internet, and, and that's it. So we're going to kind of break these down. Jeff and I will make some recommendations for all of these paths. But uh, uh, Jeff, which way, you know, before we get too started, did you learn? What did you start with for a helicopter? So I started when I was real young with a GMP cricket. And I actually took the helicopter from my dad. He bought it. And I just learned how to bounce it around. And then I actually moved into a Blade CX. Simulators weren't as popular as they are now back then. You're talking 26 years, 27 years ago. So you just, I learned the, the way that I don't want to tell people to learn. I learned the crash it, fix it, crash it, fix it, repeat. And that's not the way to learn. <laughs> so you went the expensive route, but. Um... I went, and I can definitely tell you anybody right off the bat, it's not the way you want to go. <laughs> well, I went the micro helicopter route. I'm kind of a, I'm a researcher. I, you know, I've read a ton of stuff, uh, you know, listened to a lot of people smarter than I am, you know, as I got into the hobby. So I guess I got lucky in that regard uh, and didn't actually go through a ton of crashes in my learning process. But I started with micro helicopters. Um, this is an example of one here. This is the Blade Nano S3, um, a small collective pitch uh, helicopter. But I actually didn't start with one of these. I actually started with a, with a cheap coaxial helicopter off Amazon, you know, piece of junk. You can only fly it indoors. Um, and those helicopters have two rotor discs that counter rotate against each other. There's no tail rotor um, and they stay level all the time. So really the only control you have is up, down, yaw, forwards, backwards, left, right. Um, but that taught me some basics. Then I bought a nicer coaxial helicopter. Um, some of the helicopters from Blade um, who make some great beginner helicopters, honestly. Uh, the fixed pitch stuff from Blade. And some folks will tell you to get right into collective pitch. And we'll talk about those differences in a second here. Uh, but I started with, you know, micro fixed pitch, and then I moved into collective pitch, actually used the second generation. This is the third of the Blade Nano was my first collective pitch helicopter. And then I progressed from here into something 200 size. Um, this is the Goose Guy S2. Uh, in my case, I actually used the OMP Hobby M2, was, was my first real big, you know, high-powered uh, 3D helicopter. So using micro helicopters, uh, if you fly over grass, and you're really quick on throttle hold. Now, throttle hold is a switch on your transmitter that kills the power from the motor. Um, and when you crash, if you go in without any power applied to the rotor disc, meaning the disc isn't spinning, uh, the amount of damage you do on a micro helicopter in, in long grass is often nothing um, or very little if you manage to hit hold. If you go in under power, things are still spinning, the helicopter does bad things and, and more things break. One thing real quick is that uh, that's something that I believe everybody should practice is hold when they crash, because that's something that will go with you for the whole helicopter flying experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a big dork. I actually forced myself in the simulator to use hold even when crashing in the sim, because I wanted to like ingrain that into my brain. Um, and, yeah. and I just learned by doing so. Uh, but yeah, so the micro helicopter route, you know, it could be very effective. Some of the pluses to that route are it's low cost, so the helicopters themselves are inexpensive. There's typically no building involved. There's rebuilding when you crash, but they genuinely, you know, generally come pre-built, so just take it out of the box and fly. Um, some of them come with ready-to-fly transmitters, so you don't have to learn any radio setup initially. You know, you, you can really jump right in. Um, what are some of the negatives of micro-helicopters, Jeff? There are some will say that they are more twitchy. Uh, they're not as stable as a bigger machine, which... I think with today's world, with the S2, the M2, um, I, I don't personally believe that's true anymore. I think the micro helicopters today are way more stable than they used to be, and they used to be very twitchy. But I don't see any downfall personally to beginning with the micro 200 size S, you know, the S3 from Blade or or even an M1 from OMP Hobby. Um, I think those are all great machines. 
The M1 is a very small machine. Now, it will not hold up as good as the S2 or S3 from Blade will hold up, but it's still a very cheap and inexpensive model to repair in the in the fake of a crash. So I think that would be a really good, really good point is to start with a micro machine. Yeah. And actually, since you got that in your hand, so Blade Nano S3, this is about as small as you'll see in a micro helicopter. Uh, Jeff over there has got the M1 in his hand. Um, which is what, about 150 millimeter rotor disc? Is that right? Somewhere in that neighborhood? Yeah, right around there, 130 something, 137 millimeter blade. Uh, so it's, it's a big ball. And we can see in comparison of a 200 size, so you can kind of get a little idea of the size. They are, you know, half the size. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think the sweet spot in micro helicopters for performance, a little bit more stability, because Jeff's right when he said that the little guys here are twitchy. He's right. They're, they drift more than anything else and require constant correction, which in some ways, when you learn how to master it, is great because you're really good at making a lot of corrections really quickly uh, and keeping the helicopter in one place. But really the 200 size, the OMP Hobby M2, the Goose Guy S2, um, you know, there's, there's other models in here, you know, Blade 230S. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great helicopters in the side from reputable manufacturers. Gives you a lot more stability. Uh, but they also have a lot better flight performance, right? The, you know, there's not, the motor doesn't bog, meaning there's no maneuver you can really put this helicopter through to the, where the motor runs out of power and it sort of goes and, and sort of fizzles yeah. out. It, it runs out of gas, basically, um, or torque uh, in a maneuver. Um, so these things can get themselves out of trouble. Both the OMP Hobby M2 and the Goose Guy S2 have what's called self-leveling, and we can talk about that a little bit. Jeff, what are your thoughts on self-leveling? So just to talk about it for a second, Self-leveling is a mode in the transmitter, and you can usually toggle it with a switch that will keep the helicopter level. It won't hold it in one place, it'll still drift a little, but if you move the stick to one side, it will go, and as soon as you let go of the stick, it will level itself again. Now, a, a full 3D helicopter doesn't do that, right? When you put it in a bank and let go of the stick, it stays in a bank until you correct it yourself, and then it will come back. Um, so what are the pros and cons of using self-level on the path to learning? So I would say the pros are is they're going to, the model, it's going to teach you and give you time. So if you bank the model and it starts to go, you can let off the stick and it will come back, give you time to kind of get your thoughts together, react to what you're doing, and then you continue flying again. And if you're at a fast forward flight or maybe you're practicing circles, you can, no matter what, you can always let go of the stick, helicopter, come right back to level. Now, cons, in my opinion of it is, is that they can teach you a bad habit. Now, if you only use it for a short time, I think it's a really good tool. But I think if you keep self-level on for a long time, I think it can really mess with you because when you start wanting to progress into 3D or even just big aerobatic sport flying, you get used to that. Oh, if I mess up, I can let off the helicopter's going to right, you know, stand itself right back up. But when you don't have that on, get going, you mess up. Now the helicopter goes in the ground really quickly and you don't know what happened. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree. Right? It's, it, it can form a crutch where you, you can use it as a stepping stone, so a way to progress. So the sim is the first step. The second step is hovering for the first time with auto level turned on, uh, and you just get your basic orientations. It just builds like another a step of confidence in a way. Like you're, you're giving yourself building blocks of confidence so that you, you feel ready to go on to the next step. So you start your initial hovers with self-level. You get all your corrections down in all your orientations with the real helicopter now because from the sim to the real thing, is, there's a little bit of a difference. It's obviously a lot more nerve-wracking on the real thing. And so you can start nose in and work your way to your side orientations with you know, level mode turned on. And then very quickly, as soon as you feel confident in those orientations with self-level turned on, I would turn it off. And, and I think most people will actually be amazed at how easy it is to turn off. Um, yeah. you know, th these helicopters now are, are pretty darn stable, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they won't, as soon as you flip it off, it doesn't go sideways and go flying off into the distance, right? So um, just be, you know, small movements as, as you learn, and then you'll be fine. But yeah, I agree. Turn self-level off as soon as you're ready. Uh, don't let it go too long. Right. Uh, and then, honestly, I feel like if you go the micro heli route, once you're good in this 200 size, um, and again, these also come pre-built in this size as well, typically anything larger than this you're now having to go through the challenge of building the kit yourself. So the, the largest ready to fly, uh, you know, Blade does make some slightly bigger ones. Um, 
that are that are ready to fly. But for the most part, anything bigger than this becomes a, what we call a kit build. Um, right. So that's another you know plus I should say to the micro heli route is that you really just don't have to build them, um, which is great because you know it's built right the first time because that's a learning curve as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're talking about the micro heli route uh, and some of the pros and cons. And before we get kind of into other size of models, there's one thing we haven't talked about yet. And that's transmitter choice and selection. And, and sometimes, honestly, which transmitter you've chosen, and there's a lot of great brands out there, you know, Spectrum, FR Sky, Open TX radios, uh, you know, V Control, uh, Jetty, there's tons to the list, Futaba. Uh, so, depending on which transmitter you choose, and honestly, that selection should often be based on if you have local help, what they use and know, because you'll get the most help that way. Um, but I don't want to go too deep into this, but. Uh, Jeff, how does that play into micro helicopters? What are some, I know some of these helicopters come with a ready to fly like, transmitter included in the box. Uh, and typically you can't add other models to those transmitters. Um, but some of them you can bind and fly actually to more full featured transmitters. Is that right? Well, exactly. So you can bind, so you can get what we call the Blade 230S in a ready to fly. Now, this one is just for the example, this is a completely different helicopter, but the 230S but you can get it ready to fly. So it comes with everything you need out of the box, battery, charger, radio. You charge your battery, you power it up, and you go fly. If you want to stay with a little bit smaller of the micro heli route, the Blade 150S, if you are flying on Spectrum. So if you're flying on Spectrum, another great model, bind it to your Spectrum transmitter. It even comes with the booklet in there that tells you everything, throttle curves, pitch curves, expo, percentages, everything. Or they even have predetermined model files. So you can go on your Spectrum radio, hit 150S, download the file, you find it, you go fly. If you're not flying on Spectrum and you want, or even if you are, you can go with the OMP Hobby M2, the Goose Sky S2 that you have there, add a DSMX satellite and still go fly. Or you can get this helicopter in a ready-to-fly version as well. It comes with its radio, or if you're flying an OpenTX, uh, FR Sky, Gitaba, any of these radios, they will a lot of those will bind directly to the OMP protocol or the S2 protocol because it is Fataba, and then you have that route too. So I think it really depends on what radio you're using on what micros you should look at. Yeah, absolutely right. Because if you can get help with the type of radio, it makes sense to go that route, and then that will often guide your decisions. And one of the great things about all the choices in the micro heli market is that there's one suited for every transmitter type you can find. Um, yeah. and, and let's face it, some of us are really into transmitter programming, and some of us aren't. And for those that aren't, there's paths you can choose, like the Spectrum path, um, where you download profiles for, for the whole helicopter, and it's, it, you bind and you're done. Um, Super. Or there's more adventurous paths with more programming that add more features and give you more flexibility later. But you know, we could do a whole other video on transmitter selection, and maybe we will one day. But uh, I just want to touch on that briefly. All right. With that out of the way, uh, let's talk about uh, one of our second choices here, which is the, okay. ex the experienced helper. So for me, and, and you tell me if you feel the same way, the best case scenario is a combination of the simulator and an experienced helper. If you can join a local model club uh, and get help from someone who's familiar with helicopters, not the guy that's flown one once 10 years ago, but someone who's you know, truly an RC heli pilot, uh, it can save you a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, Jeff, do you feel the same way? Definitely. I, I think that you should go to a local club, find somebody that does have experience, not somebody that's only done it a few times, and somebody that can help steer you in the correct direction, and to somebody that's not going to opinionate your direction. So I think getting that experienced helper is going to really progress your flying, your, your radio setup, your rebuilds, especially if you crash the helicopter, you don't know to put it back together right. It's a big safety concern. You got to be safe doing it. Have somebody look the model over before you go up and fly and just help you out. Yeah, I think, you know, you touched on a very key point there with, especially if it's a kit build, even if it's just an almost ready to fly, uh, having an experienced pilot check everything over, especially after your radio setup, right? You know, right. when you're a beginner, it's a little complicated in a helicopter to know when you move the transmitter, and you move it to the right, did you apply the correct you know, roll direction? Or when you think you're going right, it's actually going to go left because you've set it up backwards. Um, and, right. you know, it's not quite as obvious as an airplane where if the rudder goes to the left and the airplane's going to go to the left, and that's easy. Knowing yeah. how to identify on a collective pitch helicopter which way the blades tilt, you know, which direction it's going to go, um, takes an experienced eye. And those skills aren't hard to learn, but having someone at the field who can say, 
this is what the swash plate should do when you push forward cyclic is, you know, a great thing, can save you a ton of money. So they give you a nice safety inspection, make sure if you built the helicopter, you built it correctly, um, and just get you off on the right feet. And, and the other thing that an experienced helper can do is something called a buddy box. Now, here's another reason for going with the same transmitter as perhaps the people in your club, is you can actually link on most brands two of the same transmitter together in what's called a buddy box setup, where you have a teacher who has full control of the helicopter and on a switch can pass that control to the student. And when you get out, when you get into trouble, you manage to flip the helicopter upside down and it's barreling towards the ground. The instructor lets go of that switch, grabs control of the helicopter and saves it and saves you money by not letting it crash. Um, so an experienced Very helper can go over the helicopter. They can potentially, you know, work with you on a buddy box. And honestly, if you go to the field first, some clubs even have trainer helicopters or there'll be someone in the club who's just finished learning who has that perfect helicopter that maybe they could sell you for a good deal um, and, and, and go down that path that way. So uh, an experienced helper can save you a lot of money. And one of the other things that an experienced helper could do is maybe let you get into a larger helicopter than you otherwise would have confidence to do, right? So a helicopter in the what we call the 500 size, I don't recommend really anything larger than that as a first helicopter. Maybe 600 size is the max. 700s are awesome. But I don't know that I would start a, a raw beginner on one of those. Um, Definitely not. And and my biggest reason for it is safety because it is it, when you still when you fly something that is this size and you move up to something that's even a five six hundred or bigger size model, it becomes a whole different class of the helicopter. You you are you're flying something that can severely hurt you or someone else. And I just don't think that that is touched on enough. And you see it a lot, people jumping up to these big models and you could seriously hurt yourself. So I think you should take that little baby step. And I'm not saying that they should get size model as, as they go up the line, but I think the micro to a 450, 500 class model, get used to flying that and then move up to that six, 700 size as they feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. And I, and I think that progression from 500, 600, 700, you know, is perfect. Um, I didn't move up to the 500 until I, I felt really good on the OMP M2, uh, and then right. I started it at a 550 size, and then spent a long time at that size class before I went bigger from there. Because let's face it, helicopters are like spinning Ginsu knives um, at high RPM. They will, if the helicopter flies towards you and it makes contact with your body, it will severely injure you, if not worse. So um, you really need to treat these with a lot of respect. And that's another reason why Jeff and I were talking about throttle hold, which although you want to make sure before you crash. You kill the power to the motor such that the helicopter doesn't do more damage to itself. Conversely, if anywhere in the learning process the helicopter is coming towards you or other people or pets or anyone else, you instantly hit throttle hold. Sacrifice the helicopter instantly before you hurt somebody else or yourself. So, all right, safety speech over. <laughs> Something important to touch on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what are some of the other things you can get out of an experienced helper and, and that go in that path? most important and biggest thing is knowledge is just learning and learning because they will have tips tricks years of experience little ideas little thoughts little things that can help repair your model fix your model is something as simple as even just how to maintain your model if you're really new to the hobby you don't know what to look for so when it comes to your helicopter and your first you know even your first just plug and play bind and fly style model you don't know if all the screws are installed properly. You don't know if the helicopter is set up the right way. So that experienced pilot can teach you that those little tips and tricks that you just can't learn on your own or you just don't know. And I think another important thing is no question is a dumb question, especially when you are new to the hobby, ask away. And if people have problem answering those questions, look for somebody that does it. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think there's other, also some other nuances as well. So in the, in the smaller size helicopters, uh, the fly barless units, and that's what we call the unit that basically um, transmits your control inputs from the sticks to actions for the helicopter, while also factoring what's going on with wind and instability and, and other forces acting on the helicopter um, to keep it flying smooth and to add stability to it, um, require tuning. So on a, on a small, almost ready to fly, very little tuning is required, although you can still um, tailor them to your style of flying. And when you're a beginner, you don't really have a style. Your, your style is, God, I hope I don't crash. Um, but when you move into, say, a 500 size model and you're working with an instructor who's helping you learn and buddy boxing you, they can tune the helicopter as well 
to be more tailored to a beginner. So they're going to make it react a little slower. Um, helicopters can roll and flip and do all kinds of amazing stuff at incredible rates and speeds. They can yaw, meaning rotate, at ridiculous rates. Uh, and an experienced helper can actually turn all those settings down in the radio, in the fly wireless unit. Uh, will know which parameters to tune or adjust in the setting uh, in order to sort of make the helicopter a little more beginner friendly. Maybe they'll take out some of the negative pitch or the force that pulls the helicopter down um, or reduce pitch overall so the helicopter is a little bit tamer. Uh, and that can give you a little more confidence. When a helicopter is twitchy and small inputs make it do big things, that can be a little intimidating. So uh, an experienced helper can definitely help you uh, go that path as well. Yep, definitely. All right, confession time. I went it alone. I didn't have any experience help. I did use a sim, <laughs> but I did go the micro heli route. It took me a little bit of time to find my local club and uh, the Atlanta heli crew. I'm based here in Atlanta, and we have an amazing crew of helicopter pilots sort of spread out around the city uh, that I'm now great friends with. But it took me a long time to find that community, so I went it alone. So what are some paths to success if you have to go it alone? Definitely YouTube is your best friend. Find YouTube channels that are knowledgeable, and I'm not just talking about my channel, but any channel that you can find. Find somebody that knows what they're doing and just do your research. Study, research the model, get on some of the Facebook groups, get on Heli Direct's YouTube channel. Start looking around and finding people that you can like their videos, you can trust, and just do a lot of research. Just keep researching, read the manual on the helicopter, read the manual on your radio. Go do some video research on the radio and the helicopter and just kind of get an idea of, of what you're jumping into. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, the Internet is your friend here if you have to go by yourself. There are a variety of great communities in a variety of platforms, depending on what you just generally prefer. If you're a Facebook person, there's great communities. There's the HeliDirect Heli Addiction Facebook group where there's a very large community of pilots there. You can always ask questions. You're always going to find people who will give you advice there. If you're more of an old school forum type person, you know, helifreak.com is, is a popular forum for question and answer. And there's others out there as well. YouTube, honestly, it was my favorite place. I found a lot of great uh, content creators like Jeff and others, the HeliDirect channel, uh, where there are a lot of people trying to, we, honestly, a lot of us, we love the hobby and we want more people to, to be in it. The, the more people in the hobby, the more fun we have as a group, the more manufacturers that can release more helicopters for us to play with. Like it's win, win, win all around. So. You know, a lot of us are really passionate about helping people get into it. So we're always releasing new content. Um, there's always communities talking about it. And let's face it, our hobby is a complicated one, right? It's not like figuring out a radio control car where it's a lot easier to just get into it without any help, without any communication, without any videos. Um, this is a really complicated machine and it requires, you know, maintenance as you get into the larger helicopters and, you know, the skills to know how to repair one when you crash because you will crash. I have. I'm sure Jeff has. We all have. Um, a lot. Yeah. And it's just part of the hobby. You just, um, you know, I get it. It bums you out sometimes, but sometimes you need to learn to go, well, it was my time, right? This is how we learn. You know, if, yeah. if, if you want to come into this hobby with the mindset of I'm never going to crash and if I do, I'm out. Well, it's, it's probably not the right hobby for you, but um, crash them, learn from them, uh, move on. But yeah, lots of great communities all over the internet, Facebook, internet forums, uh, all of those places. I think you'll find a lot of people will also answer emails if you message them directly, um, myself and Jeff included. Um, you know, yeah. We're always looking to help folks um, from there. So what else? What yeah. are other, obviously we talked about the simulator already, but what else can a, can a solo person do? I think just practicing a lot is what a solo person needs to do, is, is just practice and research as much as humanly possible. And of course, try to find a local group. Yeah, and I yeah. think, and we're going to cover this in some future videos coming up, but the progression should be very, very slow. It's boring. I know Jeff called it orientations, but yep. learning how, you know, flying an entire battery of tail and hover is just what you do initially. We all went through it. You just sit there with a the helicopter hovering in front of you until all those corrections become second nature. And then you slowly rotate it a little bit, especially if you're by yourself and there's no help and you get a little comfortable with the nose pointing, you know, slightly away from from tail in, you're just getting comfortable here and you slowly work your way to here and then around. So when you go solo, you gotta be prepared to go slow. If you don't go slow solo, you go expensive solo. You're gonna crash a lot. And granted, parts for these little helicopters are not outrageously expensive, but they do add up after a while. Um, yeah, and it's encouraging. It's, it's not, you know, it just gets, it gets encouraging and it just becomes, 
you know, something that a lot of people will walk away from. And one thing about the orientations that I think is very important is that they may seem very boring now and they, you may not like doing a battery pack, a tail end hover or anything like that, but everything you learn in, as your orientation wise with the helicopter will help progress into future flights. So when you're doing figure eights, that's learning off of regular circuits. When you're, when you're just doing stall turns, that's learning off of your forward and back moment. It's just everything you do all the way up to the most aggressive 3d maneuvers all come off of that orientation work. Yeah, a hundred percent. And they're all building blocks and there's no, yep. there's no fast way. There's no way to skip steps. And if you do, no. it comes back to bite you later because you'll be, you'll be trying to learn a complex maneuver and you missed that one orientation where the helicopter is, you know, inverted nose in towards you or whatever it is. And you're suddenly going to have a weakness at that point. So you have to go slow. You got to master the building blocks, you know, one step at a time um, as you work through it. Now, one of the yeah. other things we haven't talked about here. So we talked about those auto level modes where the helicopter will, you know, level the rotor disc. What we haven't talked about is using that to your advantage as a, what we'd call a panic feature or a rescue. Um, yeah. So if, for example, you're flying the Goose Guy S2 and you're flying it in what would be called 3D mode, meaning there's no self-leveling going on, you're in full control of the helicopter, and you get in this weird orientation where the helicopter is suddenly like this and it's starting to drop and you're confused, you can actually put that self-level feature on a momentary switch, meaning you have to hold it towards you or maybe push a button depending on the transmitter, and it will instantly self-level itself. And we call this a form of rescue. So when you're learning by yourself, and you get freaked out because of this orientation, pop that rescue switch, the helicopter won't necessarily stop drifting, but it will level itself, which gives you a minute to collect yourself and say, okay, I'm at least upright. I can give a little positive collective so the helicopter's not going to fall. It's going to go level, and it's either going to climb or stay level. And then it gives you a chance to kind of play with the yaw a little, figure out which way the tail's facing, um, and save your helicopter before it hits the ground. I think... I personally, I set rescue on every helicopter I own to this day. Every helicopter of mine has rescue set up. I never use it, but it's there. And I think rescue, some people will argue and say that rescue is a bad thing. You're not learning and all that. But rescue is a great option to have, especially when you are progressing in your learning. And as you are pushing your, because if you don't ever push yourself and you get comfortable, you're not going to progress. You have to push yourself. And when you push yourself, you're going to crash. And it doesn't matter if you're just doing pushing forward and back. It doesn't matter. You're going to crash if you don't push yourself. So I think having that little safety caution that you have rescue, that if you push yourself that day, you mess up, you flip the switch, it saves the helicopter. I think it's a great thing to have. Yeah, 100%. And, and there's no shame in it, right? If anyone tells you like, oh, man, do a roll or do this or do that maneuver you're not ready for, like, don't let anyone push you faster than you're ready to learn. Yes, you do always have to be and on all of us, even the pros, when they get to these really advanced levels, when they're trying to make it to the next level or learn the next maneuver, they're uncomfortable too. They get to these mm -hmm. points where the orientations are weird in these crazy complex movers, and they're not really sure what's happening with the helicopter. We're all, as we learn, on this edge of being uncomfortable. And eventually you learn where that line is and how to ride the edge. And that's how you progress and move forward and become a better helicopter pilot. Because if you never challenge yourself at anything, right, you're just going to stay at the same level you are. Um, and rescue is a great way to give yourself a little bit um, more confidence. All right, so I know we've talked a lot about models in the 200 size and smaller, but we haven't really talked about if you do have someone helping with you, what would be a good model in the, say, 450 to 550 size? Uh, Jeff, anything you recommend in that size? Personally, my favorite model in that size is the, the SAB RAW 420. I think that that is an incredible model, and... It is a good size. It's going to give you more of a confidence while flying. It's bigger. It has that bigger disc diameter to it. It feels solid, but it's still simplistic. It's a very simplistic design. It's still pretty inexpensive to repair in a crash. It is strong in a crash, and it's a great neck size up. It, it looks really big in the air, and I think, it, I think it's a great size. Either that or... you. Uh, any 500 size model, I think, is a really good next step up from your, you know, 200, your M2, S2, 150, something like that. Yeah, I think I'm going to show you my favorite in that size. So I like this has a custom canopy on it um, available at HeliDirect. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, this is a XL Power Nimbus 550, um, which is a fantastic either second model, maybe third model, um, or if you have an experienced helper. 
It's a great size helicopter. So it's not so large that it's crazy intimidating. You know, it's a lot smaller than a, than a 600, but uh, it's super stable. It flies great. It also flies great at lower head speeds. So head speed, or how fast the rotor disc rotates, is adjustable. And a helicopter behaves uh, with more agility, or agility, like it'll rotate faster, snap faster, move faster in any direction the higher the head speed is. When you lower the head speed, especially as you're learning, you get two things. You get a helicopter that's a little tamer, so it doesn't react quite as fast. Um, and you also get more flight time, right? So the, the slower rotor disc turns, the more you power your battery and you know, you're not consuming as much power from the battery, so your flights just last longer, which when you're just learning to hover, you, know, you can easily get seven minutes out of a helicopter at a lower head speed on you know, a standard battery pack, which is great. So the Nimbus 550, awesome helicopter, super light. Definitely recommend this uh, in the 500 size. And my favorite helicopter in that size is actually the Raw 580, even of a 700. I prefer to fly my 580 over my 700s. You know, I just I love that size helicopter. I, I couldn't agree. I actually have, I have a RAW 580 as well. And a lot of people, because I have the RAW 580 and the XL Power Nimbus 550, ask me which one I like better. And every time I say the same thing, whichever one I flew last, I, you know, I love them both. They're both great flying helicopters. They're slightly different from each other, but not in bad or good ways. They just perform, you know, they have a style of their own to some extent, and they fly just a tiny bit differently from each other. Uh, they're different weights. Um, the Nimbus is a little lighter, but I love both of them, man. They both fly fantastic. But yes, another another second for the Raw 580. Great flying helicopter. Easy to repair as well for a beginner. Um, Very easy to repair. All right. But again, those 550, 580 size models, those are not for somebody going it alone uh, unless you've been through, you know, several models first. Um, don't jump into one of those right out of the gate. That's definitely going to be too much. And that's going to get very expensive to repair very quickly. Yes, very expensive. And that's another reason not to go the 600 and 700 and larger route. The larger the helicopter, the more expensive the parts, the more expensive it is to repair when you crash it. So the smaller ones will save you a lot of money. You can buy three S2s for a couple parts for a 700. <laughs> exactly, right? And that's ready to fly with the motor and everything else in it, you know, before you start buying uh, some of the other stuff. So with that, you know, I think that's a pretty good overview on sort of how to pick your first helicopter. Um, you know, we could talk probably for hours about this. And because there are a lot of factors, like we said, what's your situation are there clubs in the area? Uh, what does everybody else fly in your area? You know, aligning yourself with some of the same brands of the other flyers in your area means you'll have more experience on how to build and how to repair them. Um, so while one helicopter might be highly recommended by someone else, if there are five guys in your club and they all fly in a line 550, maybe you should start with an Align 550 because you're going to get a ton of help on that helicopter. Definitely. And the same with the radio. If, if a, five, a bunch of people at your club have a particular radio, that's what you should go with. Hundred um, percent. And again, I did learn on my own. You can. Um, I got to a pretty decent level of very sort of beginner three D um, on my own before I found anybody else in the hobby. Um, but some ways to find some people. The AMA's website um, is a great resource, and we'll put that in the description um, to find other clubs in your area. And then you can just drop into the club on a weekend when they're busy flying, and you'll quickly figure out who the helicopter people are. Your local hobby shop may be able to point you to where people fly locally. Um, and then again, online. I'm literally going into an active helicopter forum, you know, the IRC Heli Hangout, the Heli Direct uh, Heli Addiction Group on Facebook and saying, hey, I'm in Syracuse, New York. Are there any helicopter guys nearby? And, you know, five guys will drop in and say, yes, and, you, know, you can chat with them and, and see what the best resources are to learn in your area. Definitely. All right. With that, I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, do let us know in the comments what uh, beginner topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, we are planning some videos in the future from a sort of beginner flight school uh, to probably some transmitter and equipment programming videos. You know, you know, lots of stuff coming in the future uh, from us here at HeliDirect. Uh, again, any questions, drop them in the comments as well. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, get you an answer. Uh, with that, I'm Nick Wisdom. I'm Jeff West. And you're watching Hack TV.